Welcome everybody to this webinar marking the 75th anniversary of the establishment of the Commission of the Churches on International Affairs. Indeed, this commission, this pillar of the international ecumenical movement was created 75 years ago in 1946 as a voice for the churches in the field of international affairs and particularly vis-a-vis -vis the post-World War II new international order uh, established under the United Nations. To be a vehicle, in fact, for formulating the Christian mind on world affairs and applying that mind to the challenges in that arena. So we are, in fact, meeting as the Commission of the Churches on International Affairs during these very days in South Africa, uh, hosted by the South African Council of Churches. And this webinar forms an important part of the program of our gathering. It's kind of a reunion of sorts, because in addition to present members and staff of the CCIA, we also have online in this webinar a number of many, in fact, past and present, as well as present members and staff who are participating in this, uh, in this anniversary event. It's in fact the second webinar that we've held uh, for this anniversary. The first one was a conversation with and among um, uh, former uh, directors, present and former directors of CCIA. And this webinar will be a conversation with past and present moderators. So we're delighted to have a, a significant number of the surviving, uh, international, uh, surviving moderators of the Commission of the Churches on International Affairs with us. We're very sorry that one of those former moderators um, Professor Theo van Boven is unable for personal reasons to join us, and we very much miss him. But uh, I'd like to share the list of the former mod moderators that uh, have taken this leadership role on behalf of the international ecumenical movement. So I trust you can see the screen with the, uh, the names and the faces of those past moderators being presented to you now. Thank you. So we will begin our proceedings by um, some opening words from the Deputy General Secretary of the World Council of Churches, uh, Professor Isabel Apao Piri. Uh, Isabel is the, as I said, the Deputy General Secretary of the World Council of Churches and has served in this capacity since August 2012. She's a Presbyterian from Malawi. In her previous job, she was full professor of African theology, dean and head of the School of Religion, Philosophy and Classics at the University of KwaZulu-Natal in Pietermaritzburg, South Africa. She's been engaged with the churches and the ecumenical movement for, movement for decades. From 2002 to 2007, amongst her many other responsibilities, she served as general coordinator of the Circle of Concerned African Women Theologians. She received her Bachelor of Education from the University of Malawi, and holds a master's degree in religious education from the University of Lancaster, England, and a doctorate in religious studies from the University of Cape Town, South Africa. Isabel, the floor is yours. Thank you very much uh, to you, Peter. 
Greetings to all of you. It is my privilege and great pleasure to welcome you all to this second webinar, marking the 75th anniversary of the WCC Commission of the Churches on International Affairs. In my capacity as Deputy General Secretary, the Commission falls under my responsibility. And I have to say that it's engaging with the commission has been an enriching experience. There have been eight CCIA moderators, as you have heard from Peter, over the last you know, 75 years. And we are happy that you know, three of them have joined us today. As CCIA moderators, they have acted as conveners of the commission but also they have given vision and impetus to the work of CCIA. They are usually selected because of their expertise and remarkable track records in international affairs, as well as their connection to ecumenical cycles, uh, cycles. These CCIA moderators have made it their priority to ensure ecumenical unity when engaging our member churches in, their, in the matters of international relations, peace and justice issues. Together with other members of the commission, they have engaged and developed a refined thinking on a wide spectrum of issues from religious freedom, disarmament, church-state relations to human rights in general. Today, this webinar will also have as panelists five CCIA women commissioners who will be in a dialogue with the three moderators. These women commissioners come from different regions, different ages, and different denominations but they all have in common that they have social justice issues at the core of their heart. We celebrate them and look forward to their insights. In particular, we also celebrate the only female CCIA moderator, Dr. Janice Love, and the only female CCIA director, Reverend Elena, Giddens, who, is, who are connected online. Today's webinar is an opportunity to assess and also reminisce with past and current CCIA moderators about some of the challenges and achievements of the past seven decades, and particularly to reflect on how the ecumenical family has reacted and positioned itself in international affairs over the past 75 years. The discussion will also be an opportunity to envision how the voice of our Christian family can shape and address current and future international challenges, such as the climate emergency and racial justice and you know, issues, including COVID. We hope you enjoy this historic celebratory conversation. I thank you. Thank you, Isabel. So I'm going to introduce now the uh, former moderators and the, uh, the other presenters and discussants who will be leading the rest or providing the content of the rest of this webinar. Uh, each of the participants have such extensive resumes that I cannot possibly do justice to them in these brief introductory words. Uh, but I do feel necessary to share with you some of the qualities that each of these speakers hold. So first, let me introduce the current moderator of the Commission of the Churches on International Affairs, Reverend Dr. Frank Chikane. He is an emeritus pastor of the Apostolic Faith Mission of South Africa, as well as an international president of the AFM International for 23 years up to 2019. 
He's a former member of the National Executive Committee of the African National Congress, Deputy President of the United Democratic Front, Deputy President of the Soweto Civic Association, a Commissioner of the First Independent Electoral Commission, which was responsible for the 1994 democratic elections, a Director General in the Presidency during the presidencies of Thabo Mbeki and Kalema Motlante, a Deputy Secretary of Cabinet during the presidency of Nelson Mandela, and Secretary of the Cabinet during, during Mbeki's and Motlante's presidencies. Amongst many other church responsibilities and ecumenical responsibilities held, he has held in this country, he was General Secretary also of the South African Council of Churches in the past. The, uh, one of the next speakers as former moderator is Mr. Chel Manje Bondovic. An ordained priest in the Lutheran Church of Norway, Mr. Bondovic is the founder and executive chair of the Oslo Center established in 2005. He was prime minister of Norway from 1997 to 2000 and again from 2001 to 2005. He held also a number of ministerial level posts during his long political career. He was appointed special humanitarian envoy for the Horn of Africa by UN Secretary General Kofi Annan from February 2006 to August 2007 in response to the recurrent drought and food insecurity devastating the region at that time. Uh, Mr. Bondovic uh, will be arriving shortly, I imagine, to join this webinar, but uh, he was delayed by a previous engagement, so he couldn't be uh, online with us immediately. But let me move to introduce Dr. Janice Love, who as also a former moderator of CCIA, who holds dual appointments as Mary Lee Willard Dean and Professor of Christianity and World Politics at Emory University's Candler School of Theology, where she has served since 2007. She's an internationally recognized leader in church and ecumenical arenas and a scholar of world politics, particularly issues of religion and politics, conflict transformation and globalization. Before coming to Emory, she served on the faculty of the University of South Carolina for 22 years in the departments of religious studies and political science. She has been a leader at state, national and international levels since she was in high school, including representing the United Methodist Church at the World Council of Churches from 1975 to 2006, leading the WCC delegation to the UN Fourth World Conference on Women and serving on the boards of several United Methodist agencies. Then to the interviewers and to those who will be posing questions in this conversation with uh, the former moderators, I would like to introduce Reverend Shirley DeWolf, who is a Zimbabwean serving the 46th year as pastor in the United Methodist Church. After accompanying her congregation through Zimbabwe's war against colonial rule in the 1970s, she joined the ecumenical effort for post-war recovery and national reconstruction. Her work among Mozambican war refugees in Zimbabwe from 1983 to 1994 connected her with the AACC and WCC programs for refugees and migrants. And she helped to establish and coordinate a network of churches in 13 countries of the region to extend the church's ecumenical focus to a ministry of accompaniment with forced, forced migrants and destabilized communities. Then Reverend Professor Dr. Cornelia Fulkrug Weitzel, who is currently a member of the Commission of the Churches on International Affairs. She is a pastor and political science expert and was president of Broad for Die Welt and deputy chair, chairwoman of the Protestant Agency for Social Work and Development. Since 2000 until February 2021, she has been leading the Protestant charity, Brot for Die Welt, of which Diakonia Katastrophenhilfe is also a part. She's worked for many years on a variety of international supervisory and advisory bodies within the World Council of Churches, the Lutheran World Federation, and the Global Coalition of Church-Run Charity Organizations, ACT Alliance, of which she was chairwoman from 2010 to 2014. Sovina Gazarian served as CCIA commissioner from 2007 to 2013. She currently works with the Ecumenical Armenia Roundtable, established by the World Council of Churches and the Armenian Apostolic Church. ART is active in the field of social diakonia, development, emergency preparedness and response, and conflict transformation. She works together with church-related community development centers and NGOs. 
And living in a conflict prone country in a turbulent region, emergency preparedness and response, conflict transformation, peace and human security is part of her daily work at ART. The Reverend Dr. Bernice Powell Jackson currently serves as pastor of the First United Church of Tampa, a 135 year old congregation of the United Church of Christ. From 2004 to 2013, Dr. Jackson was the North American president of the World Council of Churches, was a member of the Central Committee of the WCC for a number of years, and served as a CCIA proxy briefly during this time. From 1999 to 2005, she served as Executive Minister for Justice and Witness Ministries of the United Church of Christ, and as one of the five officers of that denomination. And finally, Monica Vincent is a policy advisor in Amnesty International. She is a lawyer and founder of Vincent's Law Firm, India. Previously, she served as senior consultant in the Ministry of Law and Justice in India and human rights officer in the Commonwealth Secretariat at London, in London, UK. She briefly worked at the International Criminal Court in The Hague, the Netherlands, as well as with Amnesty International India and Human Rights Law Network in New Delhi. She served as legal reporter for Madras Law Journal and also served as panel advocate in the High Court Free Legal Services Committee, taking up pro bono cases of poor and marginalized communities. She served as CCIA commissioner from 1999 to 2006. So I welcome all the um, former moderators and uh, discussants and contributors to this discussion. And I invite the first speaker who will be, I believe, uh, under a section on international ecumenical and silent diplomacy and tension between positions of CCIA and the churches, Bernice Powell Jackson. Thank you and good day to everyone. Our first two questions are for Dr. Love and here's the first one. Through the years, the CCIA played an important role on behalf of the churches in working on critical human rights and peace issues of the world. And often that meant that some churches and some world leaders were unhappy with the WCC and the CCIA. What were some of the examples of this tension during the time that you were in leadership and how did you navigate this and what learnings did you take away? Hello everyone, it's so good to see you. Please excuse the quality of my voice today. I have a, I'm getting over a cold and um, so my voice is very different than it would be what a joy to see so many friends and colleagues in this work. Um, we all are um, looking well and a little bit aged from the last time that I was with you in person. Uh, so, uh, but it's such a joy to see your faces. Um, when I reflect on this question, one of the remarkable realities was that the churches were so united on so many issues. And um, it was a joy to see actually the lively debates in um, the Central Committee, in the assemblies, in the CCIA itself, on a wide range of issues where the statements that we issued and the actions that we authorized had a remarkable support from uh, church leaders from across the world. And so I think the World Council of Churches was um, an extraordinary instrument of uh, Christian unity in action on many occasions. Um, the uh, opportunities to seek peace in the Korean Peninsula uh, comes to mind. But there were moments, uh, noteworthy moments, uh, when there was sharp controversy. And um, one of my most vivid memories is the assembly uh, in Canberra in 1991 and the debate over the Gulf War statements and other uh, public statements there, uh, where a small number of delegates, actually it was not the majority of delegates, it was actually a very, very small number of delegates led by the Church of England. 
uh, and they were uh, overwhelmingly opposed to the sentiments that were being expressed by a vast majority of the delegates in that assembly against uh, the United States invasion of Iraq. Uh, and um, and they, they kept us in a, a lively debate for a long time. But the, um, but the assembly acted and acted with courage and uh, with clarity. And um, so it was a, a good moment. My government was often on the receiving end of appropriate criticisms for its activities across the world. Uh, the United States military might and its human rights abuses and its eagerness to be militarily engaged in many parts of the world was appropriately criticized by the World Council of Churches, CIA, uh, CCIA and others. And um, what was very interesting about that, however, was that the church leaders in the United States were overwhelmingly supportive of the kinds of actions that the World Council of Churches took. So what was frequently the case in my experience was the churches had um, a common voice that they wanted to exercise in public affairs and the governments uh, sometimes didn't like it at all. And uh, that was okay. Our call was to be uh, true to the gospel of Jesus Christ and its um, demand that we witness to peace and justice. Thank you, Dr. Love. Uh, my question to you um, is, is actually the second question. It is in the context of the Cold War. Um, could you speak to uh, the major changes in the work of CCIA after the end of the Cold War and um, probably uh, throw some light on the lessons learned for future? Um, well, one of the things that I think was um, really powerful about CCIA was that it was guided by certain principles of solidarity with uh, the churches and um, witness to uh, the love and grace of Christ in, in protecting human rights, in calling for peace uh, and justice. And so what the end of the Cold War provided opportunity was to exercise that in ways that were not possible before. Um, and to receive the uh, rather vigorous feedback from church leaders in Eastern Europe, especially, that had not been available to them in the past. The possibility of um, the, well, let me start again. The World Council of Churches was a pivotal outlet of opportunity for church leaders in Eastern Europe prior to the end of the Cold War. And um, they were very constrained, as you know, by their um, governments, uh, which were very oppressive in human rights and um, had a long history of um, uh, seeking to diminish the witness of the churches in those countries and um, a lot of bloodshed against uh, churches and their followers in um, Eastern Europe and the former Soviet Union. And so um, the voices of those church leaders were prior to the Cold War inevitably muted against their own governments and the World Council of Churches was a pivotal outlet uh, to help them uh, stay connected to the rest of the world and to witness as well as they could um, in the face of uh, totalitarianism in some cases. So um, when, when the Cold War ended, that was not the end of oppression in Eastern Europe by any stretch, but it was an opportunity to hear their voices anew and many of their voices were extraordinarily critical of the World Council of Churches itself and of uh, what the World Council had done. It was also an opportunity for 
those of us um, involved in World Council of Activities to learn much more deeply and clearly the history of what had been going on during the Cold War uh, between churches and um, their um, governments. Uh, and it was not always uh, happy news uh, for us to learn those details. So it was um, a time of great change and turmoil and uh, opportunity for churches in the East to be, um, to exercise their voices in new ways in critical uh, conversation with the World Council. Now, I think it's my privilege to uh, uh, welcome Mr. Shell Bondovic. We didn't know each other so far very well, but I'm happy that we have the chance now for this interview. CCA has always been uh, struggling what should be uh, their relationship to the churches. Should the churches determine uh, CCA's agenda or should they influence and in what way? or should it rather be influenced by global international diplomatic and political processes uh, such as the UN agenda as, um, and et cetera. So how to balance or to connect these two? Um, this is the first question. Um, secondly, should CCIA always consult? That was another question with the local churches uh, and follow their advice and concern even if the churches were party in conflicts or silent in cases of cross human rights violations, or how should they still um, act as their prophetic voice or rather diplomatic voice? So what were the debates at your time around these questions? And what was, and that's the third question, the role of churches in designing and implementing the work of CCIA at your time? Three small questions. Yeah, thank you so much, and uh, thank you for inviting me to attend this uh, anniversary event. Uh, that's that's great, and I recall with great pleasure the time when I chaired the the CCIA uh, for eight years. I think it was from 2006, after I stepped down as Prime Minister of Norway a year before. So then I went into, uh, among other. Uh, challenges also uh, this and as and reverend and ordained pastor in the Norwegian Lutheran Church, it was also meaningful to me to, to have that position. Uh, so to your question, I, I mean that the CCIA should take relevant agendas primarily from the UN agenda and uh, from ongoing international processes. Uh, but in some situation, also agendas of member churches. And for me, it's obvious uh, why. Because UN agendas and international processes are global, uh, as uh, the World Council and CCIA are also global. Uh, a pressing uh, global challenge for the time being is, of course, the climate change. And as we are here today, uh, the world leaders are gathered in Glasgow, and I really do hope and pray that they will, during these two weeks, find um, uh, solutions, and not only by words, but by actions, uh, to save our um, planet. Um, to give an example from my time in CCIA, where we also raised a more national issue, that was when we had a mission to Pakistan addressing the blasphemy law uh, in that country that is used and I will say misused to harass and persecute Christians and other religious minorities in that country. I, I think it was a success in that way that we reached uh, the political leaders of the country, even the prime minister whom, with whom I have contact still after also he stepped down. And we know that uh, also in other countries, this is still uh, an issue. Uh, and um, it's, it's uh, time to work on that still. When talking, uh, when taking up challenges in one specific country, 
in my view, it's, it is of importance to cooperate with member churches in the country concerned, because if not, we can fail and uh, make the situation even worse for uh, minorities, especially. So that is uh, for me uh, very important. So we can listen to them, get their advice uh, and, and work together with them. As we did, for instance, uh, in Pakistan, when we went there for the blasphemy law uh, issue. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Vondrik. And uh, it's a privilege to be with all of you today. CCIA and I were born the same year. So I'm here celebrating uh, twice. I'd like to pose a question to my neighbor, Frank Chikani, about the CIA, CCIA mandate. During the period that I served as a commissioner, around 2006, I think it was, the CCIA mandate was expanded beyond its signature role of sharp and urgent intervention when critical moments arise in international affairs. And it was expanded to include the longer term guidance and nurturing of the diaconal witness of the churches and the regions. Could you comment on any lessons learned from holding these two dynamics together and perhaps give us some examples of how you're handling this during your service as the CCIA moderator. Thank you. Yeah. No, thank you very much and happy birthday. <laughs> the, uh, sharing the birthday with the commission. Let me just say that um, the, I became part of the commission uh, in 2016 from 2016. So the, the example of Zimbabwe goes over many years. And, and the closest I, I went to myself was when we facilitated um, you know, a dialogue within Zimbabwe for them to find peace and, and make peace amongst themselves. And what I found during that time, because I was in government, the government of South Africa, I have been a church leader in my own right and interacted with the churches in Zimbabwe. And where you find the churches divided in a country, it makes it more difficult to intervene and find solutions. So we had to interact uh, separately with the churches, try to get them to understand each other, uh, but the divisions were so deep that you could not get them to resolve that particular challenge. And politically, again, there were tough positions and people were holding on their positions. And we, we really tried to help them to understand that they will not have peace unless they are able to accommodate each other, they are citizens of the same country and, and therefore need to deal with the challenges. Now that I'm a, a moderator of the commission, uh, when the latest crisis hit us, again, we had to work with the churches in Zimbabwe. We had to work with Fokisa in the region. That's the forum of uh, general secretaries and, and try to help people in Zimbabwe to find ways in which they can make peace. I don't think we have succeeded uh, because uh, peace has not come and there's still conflict and it's, it's affecting the development of the country. And so the church's role should always be engagement with the affected parties, but when the churches are divided, then you've got a larger challenge. Now, of course, they are more united than they were before. And the general secretary is leading the process and I'm hoping that we can find peace.
Warm greetings from Armenia. I feel very privileged and at the same time humble to be on this panel and be able to ask questions to our distinguished moderators. So my question is addressed to Reverend Chigane, please. I would like to ask a question about the experience of CCIA in advocacy for peace in addressing issues of structural violence in cases of armed conflicts, which lead to extreme cases of violence, violation of human rights and loss of life. Many countries fall victim to global militarization and military culture nowadays, and this breeds violence. There is use of force in national and international relations, and this poses a question of survival of the humankind. While political decisions yet to materialize, we witness how the ordinary citizens bear the enormous cause of the devastating wars and violence. So I would be very pleased to hear how the CCIA could use the moral and ethical stand of the church, church leaders, church-related grassroots organizations to mobilize for advocacy and to reinforce in practice implementation of the right to peace and right to life. Yeah, the, thank you very much, ma'am. Um, indeed, I mean, the issues of militarization are a major issue. So in most of the cases we deal with, you'll find that the conflict is generated by military interest in terms of economic interest, basically. And in some instances, we intervene at the level where the problem comes from. For instance, when we dealt with uh, Israel-Palestine, we had to make a trip with the General Secretary of the World Council uh, to Washington to have a conversation with um, uh, people in Washington to say part of the problem of the conflict there comes from this issue about arms. And when you look at the budgets, and it's very clear, uh, you can't miss it. And so you have to interact with all the parties that are involved in this matter, and then involve the churches as well in the United States. And they accompanied us uh, to Washington when we had discussions with them. But there's another case of Colombia, for instance, where the conflict has been going on since the 60s and people have suffered greatly. The country looks peaceful when you arrive there, but in fact, the conflict has not come to an end. And, and when we visited uh, the leader in that country and just got a peace prize, Nobel Peace Prize, and we were able to engage each other and encourage peacemaking with the forces that were involved in the conflict militarily. And they settled with one of the parties there, but didn't settle with another. And we went out of our way to try to assist in resolving those issues. But indeed, as you do that, the ordinary people suffer on the ground. And that's the pain about conflict and military conflicts in particular. Um, we, I hope that, I mean, we'll have a way in which we can have enough influence to be able to get people to think differently and change their way of thinking. Should I add some comments here? No, please, uh, um, Mr. Van de Wick, we want to have uh, an additional but uh, complementary set of questions to you. Uh, one is, of course, uh, CCA from its inception has been an instrument of international diplomacy and uh, has ensured that the churches maintain an influential presence at the United Nations headquarters for the purpose of policy uh, um, advocacy. First question is how important for the purpose uh, for that purpose was the presence of the UN at the headquarter. Uh, secondly, um, what impact did CCIA have uh, in mediating or facilitating in concrete political crisis or violent situations such as South Southern Sudan or Sudan or Somalia and the like? 
And thirdly, now we see many non-state actors coming up being uh, a part of um, uh, war or being a strong military actors. A uh, question is, um, um, does this indicate new frontiers for diplomacy in CCIA? Yeah, thank you. I, I will comment on that, but just before that, some few uh, additional remarks to uh, what uh, my colleague Frank Sikane said just now, because in my view, it is of great importance for CCIA and church leaders and organization to point to basic Christian ethical values as the right to life and, and, uh, and to peace in situations where these values are violated or threatened. Um, and um, political leaders who are considering using violence and military means must be held accountable uh, of the human suffering such actions will lead to. In some cases, um, maybe uh, missions from CCIA or the World Councils to relevant countries and leaders could be helpful. In other situations, uh, local church leaders should raise their voices against what is developing. And it must be carefully considered in each uh, situation what is the best means. I remember the war in Iraq 2003. I was the prime minister of Norway at that time. Uh, and it was a very strong engagement from all churches in Norway against this unjust war. And I can tell you that it had an effect on the discussions and on the decision in my government. And I appreciated that uh, very much. With regard to, um, to uh, diplomacy, I will say that there are many, very often many actors who want to play a role as a mediator or a facilitator in crisis and violent conflicts also when they are made by non-state actors, as you, uh, you mentioned in the question. And to do a good job as facilitator or, medi or mediator, uh, it requires much knowledge and competence on the relevant conflict. So I am in doubt if uh, CCIA should prioritize such a role, also taking uh, into account uh, the limited resources. But I will not ex exclude the possibility for churches and or CCIA of playing a role of an added value in such a situation. And in some situations, I uh, assume that churches and church organizations being local or global may have contacts that can be used for silent diplomacy and for confidence building measures, and for the first initiative to be taken for talks and negotiation between uh, conflicting parties. But very often I think it is the best that uh, these talks and negotiations are taken further by other actors who have uh, the knowledge, competence, and uh, that are strong enough. And um, I think that uh, a presence uh, of uh, uh, the CCIA at the UN headquarters in New York is important, the same in Geneva uh, for uh, uh, the UN uh, Human Rights Council and other UN organizations. But I will emphasize uh, the importance of prioritizing what CCIA should be engage uh, in. Um, and uh, it is always important to ask ourselves, what do we as CCIA and churches represent as a Christian ethical voice or an added value in a specific issue? Uh, CCIA must not end up as an ordinary NGO or a political party. And I have seen this from the perspective of being a politician most of my life. And several times when we received statements from churches or church organizations, colleagues asked me, because they knew my background, why do they mean this and this 
as a Christian organization. What is the Christian ethical substance in this statement? And in some, issue, some cases, it was diff difficult to answer. They said it sounds like another secular non-governmental organization. So I think we always have to remind ourselves that we have an added value as a Christian organization. And, and, and think about that when we make our statements and engagements. I'm very happy to address my question to Mr. Bondevik, under whose moderation I started CCIA. Greetings from Armenia again, Mr. Bondevik. Um, the question is about the role of women and the fact that there has been only one woman appointed to moderate the commission since the establishment of CCIA, and only once there has been a woman director for CCIA. What impact do you have? Do you think it, this may have had on the effectiveness of the CCIA? Mm. Yeah, <laughs> that's a difficult question, but it's an important one. Um, to be frank, I am in doubt if this situation has an impact on the effectiveness of the CCIA work, but it may have an, an impact on the perspectives of the work of CCIA. Because to get a broad perspective of the work in every organization, also the World Council and CCIA, we need the approaches of both women and men. And of course, uh, for all of us, I think it's also a question of justice and equality between men and women. Uh, during my term as um, moderator of, uh, of CCIA, I, I had the pleasure to cooperate with a female director for some uh, of my eight years. So uh, I was in a lucky situation in, uh, in this regard, but I understand that she so far is the only who have served as a director. And, um, and uh, so I, there is really uh, a job to do here and uh, how to change the sit situation or getting more women into future leadership. I think it is by primarily by nominating more women from the member churches. And of course, also an active role in this regard from the leadership of the World Council itself. So these are the two main means, I think, for changing this uh, situation. But uh, I'm glad to see today now on my screen that it's a rather good gender balance, uh, at least at this event as far as I can see it on the screen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. My question is to Jen Luff, the first female moderator of CCIA. Uh, and the question is like that. Uh, how were you received, as you see it now, from a mainly or primarily male staff, not only, hello Genevieve, uh, but mainly <laughs> male staff, first of all. And secondly, um, did you, from your point of view, meet specific difficulties due to the fact that you were a female leader? And what do you believe, what kind of impact that ha this had on the work of CCIA? Um, thanks so much, Cornelia. Um, it was such a joy to work with Cornelia when I was uh, working in the World Council of Churches. So it's a joy to see you again here. Um, I began my work with the World Council of Churches representing the United Methodist Church in 1975 and um, held um, leadership positions in the executive committee and uh, heading up unit two beginning in 1983. And by the time I became um, the moderator of CCIA in 1991, I had a lot of experience um, in leadership in the World Council of Churches and uh, in my own denomination. And uh, was very, I was, I was very well known, and um, so I, I uh, felt respected, 
and I felt supported and um, I felt um, very much the collegiality of the staff of uh, CCIA and for that matter of the World Council of Churches. Having said that, however, it's quite clear that the world of um, leaders in the Christian churches is incredibly male. It's a very patriarchal world. And um, the world of leaders in diplomacy and international affairs is very much a male dominated world, uh, a patriarchal world. And so the World Council of Churches frequently had an opportunity <clears throat> to witness to women's leadership in those circumstances and in those uh, dominant cultures. And uh, I was delighted and honored to be part of that witness of what women leaders can achieve under those circumstances. Um, I, um, of course, any woman in any male dominated circle will experience some instances of sexism. I can't imagine that that's not true um, for most women's experiences. Uh, but um, so for example, in a room full of men, it would frequently uh, take some time for, for the, the, those gathered to even acknowledge uh, that there were women in the room who might be able to make uh, good contributions. Um, women get interrupted, all the normal um, pedestrian ways that sexism is expressed. But I personally felt very supported by the, the staff and uh, the commissioners. And I felt uh, deeply respected uh, as I um, expressed respect myself for my colleagues in those circumstances. So um, it's often the case, I, I'm, I'm not what we in the United States call an essentialist. Uh, I don't think that by their gender, uh, women uh, necessarily give different leadership than men. I think it very much is conditioned on the um, culture in which women enter. So we have seen women heads of state and women diplomats and women leaders behave just as badly as male leaders uh, on occasion. And um, that's really um, sad to watch, but um, their gender doesn't necessarily determine uh, their behavior. On the other hand, we see that women as a whole are victims of special kinds of human rights abuses and special kinds of violence. Uh, sexual violence and rape, for example, are widespread across the world and um, instrumentalized in um, situations of human rights abuse and war. And um, that's, a, that's a horrible but ubiquitous reality that um, the World Council of Churches has at times placed a priority on uh, in addressing and is one issue that uh, continues to be uh, in great need of um, being addressed by the churches and um, by anyone who cares about human rights. So um, those are my initial reflections. One question is addressed again to Mr. Bondevic, please. How much does CCIA care about the status and participation of women in global UN structures, its commissions and debates, for example, on violence, war, and issues of peace? Did it address or promote women's issues such as gender justice on the UN level? For instance, were women involved in secret diplomacy missions? And if why not? Well, uh, I don't have the overview to give you um, a, a concrete uh, answer, but I think we can admit that we had too little focus on this uh, during my time, at least in the CCIA. Um, as far as I remember, we 
from time to time uh, touched upon this challenge, but we were not focusing on this challenge as we should do. Also with uh, regard to uh, the UN. Um, why? Well, it is difficult to say, but it may be a consequence of lack of consciousness on this issue in general, in church environments. But I think that um, the situation has improved uh, a bit over the last year since I stepped down from uh, CCIA. Uh, let me use also this opportunity to say that I recall with great pleasure my, my time uh, of serving in CCIA. Still, I have uh, three boxes of documents. Uh, here you see in my office uh, with the papers and reports uh, minutes and so on from uh, the time in CCIA and I see uh, just having a look through them that some of them are relevant also to what we are discussing under this section. I see we made a report on violence on women for instance uh, during my time uh, also with regard to a uh, HIV AIDS, uh, environment, social justice, poverty, and several other reports as well. So um, we were, um, I think we were uh, on the ball. We were relevant for what was going on in, uh, in the UN agenda and international agenda in general, but uh, unfortunately not focusing enough on the role of women being in diplomacy missions and in the work of the UN in, in general. But um, I stepped down now, um, uh, I, it's, it's uh, several, uh, eight years ago, I think. So, um, so I think the situation has improved. So my question is uh, both to Dr. Love and to Dr. Chikani. Uh, and it's a two-parter, one that focuses internally on the CCIA and the other which focuses more externally. So what would need, what would we need to, to be assured that women are included in the future leadership of the CCIA? And then the second part, as we face increasing hatred against women, all around the globe um, with regard to women's rights and women's participation. Uh, will the current CCIA commission uh, recommend to the assembly to address the issues of women's rights and uh, women as peacemakers and leaders at the UN and other national and international levels in the upcoming period of the WCC post assembly? Dr. Love, maybe you can answer, especially that first part. <laughs> um, I think that the World Council of Churches simply needs to ensure that it is well aware of the women leaders who exist in the churches and who have sufficient expertise to give um, guidance in these areas. Um, as I said in my earlier response, um, the church is a very male dominated arena. And so one has to go looking frequently uh, um, in circles to make sure that you um, dig beneath the surface to find um, the extraordinary talent of women and the leadership of women uh, in male dominated circles. And the World Council of Churches has some experience with this um, and um, can uh, be more thorough in searching out um, the skills, the talents, the extraordinary leadership that women give uh, in their own right. Uh, but you have to often look for it because the church leaders who engage in uh, the ecumenical movement, um, I'm happy that increasing numbers of women are church leaders recognized fully in their own right by their churches, but um, it's still a very mixed picture around the world. And so the, the World Council of Churches has an extra duty 
to go looking for those smart, capable, deeply committed women that exist, um, but you have to go find them. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Chikani, you're muted. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, and uh, thank you for responding first, Neb. <laughs> so that, yeah. <clears throat> the, let me just say for the World Council of Churches, the World Council of Churches I experienced when I was General Secretary of the SACC in the 80s and early 90s is different from the World Council of Churches I found in 2016, 2017. So clearly there's been radical change. And, and, and I mean, the, you wouldn't be thinking about whether one is male or female when you are in the Central Committee meeting, uh, the meetings that I've attended and efforts have been made. I mean, the level of consciousness is higher the commission I am chairing, you know, we never think about whether one is male or female. We have got quite a number of, I mean, quite a number of extraordinary women. I mean, my vice moderator is a professor in a university and, and we work it very well. And, and the rest of the team are doing very well. And, and we make all the efforts to equalize things and make sure that, and I'm hoping even the next commission will, will meet the requirements and the standards of making sure that there is equality uh, in, in dealing with uh, appointments of leaders. The problem is at the level of the denominations which was my experience at the SACC level now as vice president, I just ceased to be one a week ago. I mean, the churches simply send you leaders who are male. And when you have a conference, you have to fight to get them to change. If you've got an emergency meeting of church leaders in South Africa, the likelihood is that the, the room will be full of men and one or two women. And that's a struggle we need to wage. The change must change, must happen at the level of the churches and, and member churches. And that's where the pressure should be put because it won't happen naturally. Well, thank you very much to all the speakers uh, thus far for very incisive questions and uh, informative responses. Um, I want to encourage all the participants in this gathering to use the chat box for posing questions or making comments uh, for of what uh, has been heard. Later in the program, we will uh, try to pick up some of those comments and questions. But for now, I just want to intervene in order to acknowledge the presence among the many esteemed participants in this, uh, in this event, uh, some key individuals. And I want to start, since we've been talking just now about the, the role of women's leadership in uh, ecumenical uh, activities in this field, I want to acknowledge the presence of Eleonora Giddings Ivory, who already, who, he who headed the Commission of the Churches on International Affairs at the Secretariat level in the past. The, uh, the presence also of Genevieve Jacques, who served as a senior director level um, uh, staff member uh, in WCC with responsibilities in this area. And our current moderator of, our commission, of the Central Committee of the WCC, Dr. Agnes Saboum, who is also in line with us. But then I'd also like to mention the presence uh, in this gathering of former WCC General Secretary, Conrad Reiser, and former CCIA Director, Reverend Dwayne Epps, you are all most welcome to join in joining us in this gathering, along with all the other participants that are present on the Zoom platform and following the live stream. Thank you so much. I do want to also encourage all participants uh, to, to use the, uh, to keep your cameras, your, your videos open, because 
we're entering into this uh, discussion in the spirit of a, a, a celebration, a, a reunion of CCIA past and present. Uh, and so we love to see your faces online as well as your names. So we now move into a, uh, a segment, the next uh, series of speakers, starting with a focus on the role of young leaders in international affairs. And I think Shirley DeWolf will lead us in that. Thank you, Peter. Yes, I'd like to move the discussion to youth and to put a question to the ever youthful Dr. Love, um, because I live in a continent that is said to be the youngest continent with 65% of its population below the age of 25. And this means that African youth make up the single largest component in an increasingly influential demographic worldwide. And this is a demographic that is internationally conversant. It has a new brand of politics and it has a frame of reference and a skill set for development that reaches far beyond the capacities and the concepts of most of us who were born before the turn of the millennium. So Janice, may I direct this question to you, knowing that the WCC has from the start been aware of the importance of intergenerational shaping of our ecumenical identity and agenda. But I'm wondering whether the vision and culture of the CCIA has reflected this. How do we ensure that this immeasurably powerful and increasingly independent influence of youth on the priorities and the pace of global uh, of the global agenda is reflected in the profile of CCIA's work. Um, thanks so much, Shirley. Um, I this is a very tough question because there are youth movements that that in a very powerful way uh, shaped the World Council of Churches itself profoundly. And, um, and they um, are basically, they came in waves that it was not a constant impact. And maybe now, especially uh, with the kind of youth uh, leadership that's being exercised as you describe it, uh, it's time for another wave of that. It's usually the most powerful impact of young people in the life of the church in the ecumenical movement, including the CIA, often comes in the form of uh, the youth organized for themselves and leading themselves in making demands um, to the churches and to the ecumenical movement. Um, I don't think, frankly, that bringing in young people as often token representatives into the governing bodies of um, the CCIA uh, is necessarily the way to have a, a, a credible response that uh, a response that has its own integrity to the needs, concerns, and perspectives of young people, but perhaps gathering young people themselves in ecumenical um, circles, that is gatherings of youth themselves to find out from young people what their concerns, perspectives, and actions are and uh, have been. Um, might be the better way to go. So have a world gathering of youth in international, uh, engaged in international activity. And of course we define youth um, fairly differently across the world. Uh, so for us in the United States, it would be people under the age of 20, perhaps in other parts of the world, it would be people under the age of 30 uh, uh, and I, I've seen people over the age of 30 described as useful. But I think having youth congregated together, supporting each other in expressing the deepest concerns, perspectives, and insight and leadership that they have 
is, is often the best way to hear from them and to respond with integrity to their um, needs and concerns and contributions. Um, I, I myself was a, a youth member of the Central Committee beginning in 1975, and I had, um, um, I, I, I have never really been shy or uh, I've never lacked assertiveness, but that's not the reality for most young people or most uh, young women, certainly. But when you get them together, they often have incredible support for each other in expressing their contributions and their insights. And they need a critical mass of support for each other to tell the rest of us what we ought to be doing to make um, their future a better one. Reverend Chikine, my uh, question is to you, sir. Uh, I'm actually uh, excited to be asking this question uh, because during my term in the CCIA, I served as a, as a young person representative. Um, Reverend, uh, do you think whether reconsidering CCIA's engagements with social movements and in particular uh, with young, young leaders would open new opportunities for CCIA's mandate and, and in our work, and in also resetting the agenda. Thanks. Yeah, I actually wanted to start from the previous question that um, my experience, I came to the CCIA, it was appointed already, and I found extraordinary people in the, in the CCIA and found extraordinary young people who serve in the CCIA and their contribution is comparable to any other person. And, and I valued that because the younger people help you to understand some things that we as older people would miss completely. And at times uh, we misunderstand each other because we belong to different generations. So I believe that um, younger people, I prefer using that terminology because as Jania Love, Jania Love has said, it's different levels. Some people are less than 35, they call them youth and others are less than 20. But I've found them very, helpful to make even me to understand better the issues that affect them. And the more we get them to participate, the more we engage with them, the better. And the CCIA would be a better uh, uh, institution. The other thing I would like to say, which uh, we didn't have time to dialogue amongst the panelists, it's that you find extraordinary knowledgeable young, young people who are professionals, who assist the commission to understand better some of the issues that we are dealing with because they either are specialized in it or they've got some perspectives related to it. And, and I, I think it's really valuable. Uh, and when it comes to participation of young women, it's extraordinary in our current commission. And so I value this and I hope that will build on it into the future to make uh, the commission a different commission that will have impact on the greater part of our people in the world. So the next question is for all three of our moderators. Uh, the issues of climate change, racial injustice, and income inequality threaten the world and its peoples today. In your views, what were the two or three most critical justice issues facing the world during your tenure, and how might they have foreshadowed these current world problems? 
the others must start. I will be last. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm current. I'm current. Yeah. All right. I see Jan. They have Jan uh, spotlighted. So maybe Dr. Love, you could answer first. Um, when I reflected on this question, I realized that um, the World Council of Churches and the ecumenical movement was really quite prescient uh, with regard to climate change and actually raised the issue beginning in 1983. Um, and by 1990, um, had a world convocation on justice, peace, and the integrity of creation that uh, named um, global warming, as it was uh, discussed at that time, rather than climate change, as a, an impending threat to the world. And now we look back, that was 30 years ago. Uh, so it was very prophetic and uh, powerful. And uh, we didn't quite know what we were talking about in a very detailed terms um, that one could specify as uh, 1.5 degrees, for example, of warming. But um, there were loud, wonderful, um, imaginative voices calling us to pay attention to climate change very early in the ecumenical movement. And that's very heartening. Um, my era of uh, war and peace was a very big uh, set of issues uh, in a variety of places around the world. Um, racial justice continued to be um, an issue. The militarism associated with um, many non-democratic governments and the protection of human rights. Um, so there were a lot of uh, issues that endured across time that were very present um, in my period with CCIA. Thank you. Mr. Vandevik? Yes, thank you. I can be brief here and add my voice to just what was just said now. But um, with regard to justice issues, I think in my term as moderator, as already mentioned, uh, poverty and social justice was one important uh, field of discussions and engagement. Secondly, as I mentioned, violence uh, on women was another justice issue in our, in my time, and uh, it was made a report on that. And thirdly, also HIV AIDS, which is in fact also a justice issue, came up more and more. Uh, and and was discussed. So if I should I mention three justice issues, it should be these three. Um, but it's right also that um, environment, maybe more, not so much climate change, but more specifically environment issues, was on the agenda. Now it is, of course, climate change is which is on the top of the agenda. I assume also in CCIA. I will mention another important issue. Human rights was mentioned, and that was also an engagement for us in my term. But I will also add democracy issues. Uh, democracy is, in my view, a consequence of human dignity, a, a main Christian value, uh, because it has to do with the right to influence your own society. And fortunately, we know that there has been progress with regard to democracy and more democratic states, if you see it in the perspective of the last 30 years. But the last four or five years, it, is, it has been a backfall. Uh, and, and we see it in Europe, we see it in Africa and other countries. So this is, in my view, a very serious issue. And I would encourage uh, CCIA now also to uh, really raise the issue of uh, democracy, a consequence of human dignity human rights to come higher up on the agenda. Thank you. Reverend Chikani? Yeah, let me just say, ma'am, that, that's why I wanted to speak last. I mean, if it was uh, 40 years ago, the debates would be completely different about climate change and economic issues, issues of racism. Today, I think the debate at the commission level 
it's not about whether or not you should do something about climate change. It's more about how yeah. and how do you influence the world? How do you get, you know, the debate in the forum that deals with it as it is happening at the present moment? And, and so it's more about strategies of dealing with it rather than whether or not it should. And, and the next, it's the issue of racism. Now, the, the challenge with racism, and I'm convinced, I want to say this quite clearly. I'm convinced that, I mean, if we don't go back to the roots of racism where you turn people into slaves, treat them like animals, uh, like cattle who work for you and feed them for 300 years, you, 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 you create the environment where racism becomes a way of life because you undermine other people. So I'm convinced we have just had a conference now on Africa and African diaspora in the last week and listening to people from the Caribbeans, from West Papua, from Haiti, from all sorts of places. It's very clear, unless we change the economic equation, racism will remain with us. It's not going to be a moral debate and statements. You're going to have to change the quality of lives of people so that they all relate to each other as equals and that police poverty is not related with your color or inequality, it's not related with your color. And, and I think those are critical issues for me to be able to deal with the crisis we are facing. The reality is like Deben Conference on anti-racism and other intolerances. The reality is that the major countries in this world don't want to deal with those issues and will even boycott the meetings. And, and so racism is coming back in a big way. The right-wing governments that are coming into place with very crude concepts are back with us. So we are going backwards. And I agree with um, uh, Bonavik that the issues, democracy is now threatened. You know, we, we used to think we are okay. The disinformation, fake news, uh, communication instruments that make people believe things that are way, way what tells you that we are under threat. And so I, I am of the view that we need to put much more weight on that. We need to deal with the economic injustice. We need to deal with climate change. And the economy and climate change are related. And the victims become the poorer in the process. So the, the, the commission must prioritize those issues and deal with them. Mr. Bondovic, uh, it's my question to you, sir. Uh, in one of your previous responses, you did briefly speak to your hopes and prayers about COP26. And I would like to circle back to that. My question is, um, how can our churches, our churches in the global north and in the global south, come together in solidarity with the people's movements, with the young people's voices, to accelerate our global efforts uh, to address the climate justice issues? Thank you. I, I think that um, uh, member churches in all countries should make contacts and sometimes alliances with youth organizations and people movements. Um, and I know from experience that such cooperation with churches and church organizations very often is appreciated and valued by other more secular organization. And in, uh, to give an example from my home country, Norway, it is especially the Norwegian church aid um, that is uh, making such uh, alliances with other organizations, uh, also with regard to climate change, but also, of course, especially with uh, fighting poverty and uh, for social justice. Um, but I, I think, of course, it is a challenge to seriously think about 
to which extent churches will go into more political detailed questions, detailed issues on how to meet the climate change in order not to end up as a, let me say, an ordinary political party. That is not the role of, of the churches and CCIA. Um, so I mean that the main focus of the churches and CCIA should always be uh, to point to uh, the ethical uh, values, Christian ethical values, and be a little bit careful going into political details. Uh, and I see this uh, from my experience, both as engaged in the church and for some years in CCIA, but also for the most time of my life as being a politician. Um, so, um, because as I mentioned earlier today, if the church has come out with political statement like, statements like other organizations and political parties do, we will reduce the weight and the value of uh, the church statements because the politicians expect what are the what is a shall we say the christian ethical message in this statement not the message uh, as from the red cross or other but what is a christian ethical core of this message we should always think about that if we should represent an added value which we really should both in the climate change challenge but also in others Okay. Um, thank you. Uh, one has to acknowledge that CCIA has not always been in favor or in sympathy with social movements or people's movements. This being the reason why it kept in quite some distance, for example, to the uh, World Conference on Church and Society in 1966, which brought together the representatives of liberation movements, of uh, civil rights movements and alike, and it kept in distance to the peace movement later on until the 80s. So this led to the fact that WCC organized uh, um, the discussion about these demands in different ways. So the other units came up like PCR, like CCPD and so, uh, and it led to a greater integration of uh, CCIA into WCC structure. Uh, let me say it in a very, um, funny way to, to keep it online uh, with WCC thinking. <laughs> uh, and uh, so my question is, what do you see as, uh, so this was before your time, what do you see as potential reasons for that? And uh, how do you see and value and judge the risks and chances uh, for CCA to cooperate with social movements, people's movements? Um, this is a wonderful question that, and when I reflect on it, it seems to me there are two important um, dynamics at work. One is that the World Council of Churches and its predecessor bodies were by and large uh, organized by Western men who had an extraordinary vision of Christian unity across the world, but they didn't really know what they were asking for or what they were gonna get when um, the fullness of that vision began to unfold. Mm -hmm. And the fullness of that vision only began to really unfold. Um, of course, there were some Asian participants and some a non other non-Western participants in the early days, but um, the um, wider expanse of the um, increasing membership of the World Council of Churches from churches in Africa and Asia and Latin America was uh, across time. And when one begins to represent the fullness of um, the expressions of Christianity across the world, then you get very different dynamics in the World Council itself. And when you bring in young people, as happened in the 1960s, uh, and let them speak very powerfully 
to um, the older people gathered in the World Council, that has a profound impact uh, across time and, and um, all the rest. So I think part of um, the differences in style to which you appropriately point has to do with uh, the ever widening membership of the World Council of Churches and the participation of ever widening uh, generational leaders, um, as um, Frank Giacani pointed out, youth have extraordinary insights to bring and at various points they have brought them in force uh, are in uh, large numbers. The other dynamic that this question brings to mind for me is the dynamic between those who appropriately from the point of view of Christian social movements uh, really um, point out the weaknesses of the church and point out the weaknesses of the ecumenical movement and how far we sh fall short of giving full witness to the love and grace of Jesus Christ, where we fail uh, on regular basis. That's the job of social movements, to advocate, to be strong voices in advocacy and uh, to be relentless really in advocacy. But the other uh, change happens when there are also skilled practical leaders who shall we say are more diplomatic and who know how to work the levers of change inside governments and inside churches and inside uh, other institutions like the United Nations. So I, I find it really powerful when social movements interact with longstanding practitioners who um, sympathize with the demands of the social movement and get change done together. Um, that was slow to unfold. Uh, in the time period that you are referencing in the World Council of Churches, but I think um, it seems to be in pretty uh, full expression now, uh, although I haven't followed um, things very closely in recent years. So um, I, I, I am very heartened by the complementarity of these functions and that the World Council of Churches has always reflected both the ardent expressions of prophetic witness of the um, social movements and the diplomatic skills of the practical realities of creating institutionalized change. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Can I come in? Let, let... Yeah, let me just say that um, I think the, the way in which we are structured is that we are responding to questions. But actually, it would also have helped to have an opportunity to dialogue amongst ourselves, because I think it's important, uh, because my I can see that we use different paradigms and understanding of issues from our perspective, but I, my approach, I've learned the way in which apartheid brutalized us and the way in which the church was part of it, the way in which uh, the church internationally supported apartheid until the com program to call Cortes Law and program to combat racism came in and the church was was following social movements rather than the other way around. Instead of the church showing the way, the church was always lagging behind. Um, instead of shining light, uh, the church was dragged into it to be able to be on the side of justice because the church is a child of its own time. And so my approach into life is a holistic approach that the economic life of our societies are part of their spirituality and the political lives 
of the societies are part of their spirituality. Once you separate the two, then you allow a space where people can act unethically because it's not part of their spirituality. So that's why I think of life in an integrated way uh, and that the church has a responsibility to read the mind of God in that situation. So it means we take the economic world and say, there's something wrong about it. And you use all the expertise you need. I think the, the commission requires more capacity to understand the world and the complexities of what's happening, the direction of IR and you know, artificial intelligence. We cannot be bystanders because the moral issues are contained within. And, and, and as a result, I, my approach would be more holistic that we have a say in issues of climate change, the economy, the politics of this world, because the politics are the ones that create a problem for us. They produce the injustices. Our witness would be that from the perspective of our faith, everybody must be treated equally and that nobody uh, should achieve his or her interest at the expense of others that we should build together and, and get people live a better life. And so that's my approach and my understanding. Uh, but there's no compartmentalization for me because the more we compartmentalized it, the more we got into trouble. So social movements are a major factor to educate the church and there are entities that are specialized in, you know, they are issue-based organizations. And I always say they tend to focus on that and that alone. The church, of course, need to deal with all the issues rather than just one. But that very issue-based entity will educate you better about what you need to do as church. Sorry, I took longer. Well, by doing so, you've actually partially answered the next question. <laughs> yeah. um, I'd like to come back to you on, on this and to, to do a, give a run up to my question by giving an example from again within Africa. Uh, because here in Zimbabwe, we have been wrestling with the, the wonderful resource that God has given us of diamonds mm. and all the horrors that result from having discovered diamonds in our soil. You know, Africa lives with this paradox of being on the one hand, a major contributor of natural resources to the global economy. And on the other hand, not only benefiting the least from these resources, but also suffering seriously from the negative social and political impact of the extractive industry. Um, the whole area of economic and social justice and indeed the, the geopolitical divide that you have described so deeply rooted in racism is an area in which the CCIA has responsibility, but it's an overlapping responsibility. The entire WCC family, the entire the WCC structure is concerned about this. So I'm interested to know, what's your experience when it comes to team working with the other commissions, with other uh, sectors within the World Council of Churches, Faith and Order, for example, in areas of interlinking responsibility? And how can we be more holistic in our approach by, by, by working together within the WCC in a more holistic way? Yeah, before I, I answer the question on the, uh, the WCC, um, let me start from where the problem comes from. I mean, in all the cases we are dealing with, current cases of conflict, they are all historical in the main, and they come from the colonial period, 
where the people were colonized, like in Palestine, for instance, and the colonizer leaves you with a problem. If you go to Rwanda, it's the same. It's the colonial systems that divided people and created a situation where there would be gen genocide there. If, if you go to any other area, I mean, the, every detail we are dealing with, it has, it's historical. That's the first thing. The second is that it is based on interest, an economic interest, the extraction of uh, wealth in most of the countries where there's conflict on the African continent, it's associated with natural resources. And so it is important that we dig deeper rather than just make moral statements. The second I want to say is that when I was appointed, um, Peter Probe was very good about that. We interacted with the moderators of the other commissions. There is an integration in the process in terms of faith and order, theology, and uh, you can't do CCIA work without a particular theological understanding of what you are doing. And then we also relate to missions and the missional dimension of what we are doing, the way in which we need to change the world. And, and so the integration, it's critical. Unfortunately, we are built as separate and uh, we cross-reference and attend each other's commissions to make sure that we, we don't work in silos and that the, the unit within which it is in the World Council assists us as well to be able to interact. Well, thank you once again to uh, the panelists, the former moderators and the, um, the interviewers for insightful questions and very informative responses. Um, I think we'll be chewing on this information for quite some time, particularly during the next uh, days of our meeting of the CCIA 58th meeting here in South Africa. Um, but I want to take a few minutes now just to pick up some questions uh, from the participants in this gathering, both on the Zoom platform and from the live stream. And uh, one question that's already been fed to me from the live stream and which I want to put now is um, whether the panelists, I presume that means the moderator, former moderators of CCIA, have come across challenges related to forced migration, uh, human rights violations, civil wars, uh, due to human rights violations, civil wars, dictatorships, et cetera, and about the attitudes of the churches in the receiving countries. Now, I think the short answer to that question is a big yes. I think that's been a challenge in many, many, many places. But I wonder if any of the, um, the, the speakers, the panelists, the former moderators would like to respond quickly to that question. Anybody want to volunteer? Maybe particularly from the perspective of uh, churches in receiving countries. And I wonder, therefore, whether, Jan, you would be well placed to speak to that. Well, the United States uh, of America has been through um, a very uh, terrible period of history in uh, rejecting migrants. Uh, probably you saw the world, the worldwide, uh, the terrible pictures of, of Haitian refugees on the border um, being whipped uh, with by um, border guards on horses. Um, it was a horrible image. And of course we have um, a change in administration in the United States that's very important uh, to help move a bit more in the direction of um, having a, a reasonable discussion about immigration in the United States. But we have a long history and it's current uh, today of, of very racist reactions and um, horrific treatment of uh, those who are striving to get into our country to flee persecution and to flee horrific economic circumstances. Uh, parents being separated from their children. Uh, so there's, the, the issue is very alive and well, and the churches 
have a mixed response. Um, some churches' response is excellent in uh, witnessing at the border and making sure to strive to protect human rights, um, but other uh, churches are complicit in the horrible behavior of the United States government. Thank you, Jan. Uh, would other panelists like to speak to this issue? issue? Chel Manier, please. Yes, I can uh, add a few words. Uh, it is also an ongoing debate in Norway with regard to immigration and asylum uh, seekers, and especially also family unification uh, issues. Uh, and it was a very hot debate, especially back in 2015, when we had this huge wave of immigrants coming um, through Turkey, through Hungary, up to also the Northern Europe. And, uh, and uh, Norway was not among the most generous countries, but rather good, I will say. Angela Merkel in Germany was a very uh, good and shining example. Um, and, and it was for me also interesting that sometimes she indicated that this was also on background of, of, her, uh, of her Christian faith. Uh, and um, uh, with regard to the political life in Norway, we have uh, one, I would say, more right wing party that is very anti immigration in general, and they're always playing that card during election campaigns and hope to gain more supporters in that regard. And unfortunately, to some extent, they do. Most um, uh, parties in Norway um, has a, a rather moderate, uh, good po policy in this regard. Um, the role of the churches in Norway is very mm -hmm. constructive in my view. Uh, they are always advocating not only for a, what the poli most political parties say that we want a just and restrictive immigration policy, just and restrictive. I have always said, why not? also say a more human uh, immigration policy. And that is also the message from most churches in Norway. They are raising the voices in the public debate, see, saying that it must be also a, a human uh, policy in, uh, in this regard. It could have been better in Norway, I will say, but uh, it's not among the worst. Thank you. <laughs> Peter, you will be surprised that I'm going to say South Africa is a receiving country. No, I know like it is a receiving yeah, country, yeah. but I was going to ask you to, I mean, if you wish to speak from the receiving country point of view, but I thought you would also be well placed, Reverend Frank, to speak about the issue of forced migration from the point of view of countries from which people are forced to flee. But up to you, over to you. Yeah, no, if you start from South Africa, when we became free, we opened the borders. Remember that borders were shut. There, was, there were electric fences uh, between Mozambique and us, and people were dying. And when we, we took over 94, we brought down the electric fences, everything. We were refugees. Therefore, we should actually welcome people. But, but we never planned. We didn't think about the consequences of it. And, and so because of the levels of poverty, you end up with conflicts on the ground. So I, I wouldn't say that it's more at a church level. I mean, there are um, churches that are on the periphery would support throwing people out, et cetera. But in the main, it's how we find a human way of living together. And the only way we can deal with it in South Africa is to resolve the economic problem of the country. Um, there are, you know, for the rest of the continent, I mean, there are people who are forced, they come to South Africa because there's war in this country or conflict, or they are forced to leave because of co economic conditions. And, and so unless we also solve the problem of the continent, economically, politically, we're going to have this problem persisting. And, and where there are conflicts, there are always refugees. I mean, the Uganda area, it's a place where you see refugees throughout. And so we need to work together as churches to deal with this issue and deal with politicians who have to deal with them and, and, and suggest 
feasible ways in which we can solve it. I mean, there, there's xenophobia issue in South Africa. It's happening at a level of the poor meeting the poor on the ground and, and kill each other. And it's not happening at the level of people from Zimbabwe working in new, old neutral or standard bank or it doesn't affect them. So that's, that's the challenge. I think the migration issue is the biggest challenge. Thank you, Reverend Frank. Now, I also have a question in the chat box from uh, Dr. Hanna Oyanen, current uh, member of CCIA from Finland, uh, which is posed to Chiel Manje, but uh, he seems to have dropped off the screen. I'm not sure if he's, uh... yes, there he is, great. So this is a question posed particularly to, to you, Chiel Manje. Uh, on this issue of the role of CCIA as not a normal NGO and shouldn't talk like a normal NGO, uh, which uh, Hannah acknowledges as an important point. But what if CCIA could reach a broader audience and be more convincing if it spoke in more languages or a normal language that all can understand and relate to? Do you have a response to that, Joe Manny? Yeah, I will try. <laughs> uh, well, uh, my experience, seeing from the political side of life as well, is that if church organizations spoke like all others, uh, they were not listened to. Because, uh, of course, you can say, well, we have to speak in a language that is understood by all people and by politicians and so on. But, but many reacted and say, this is a church organization. They're speaking like all others. What is the Christian substance uh, of the message? Uh, from uh, I had that reaction from several members of, uh, of governments where I both was member and later prime minister. So um, in my view, if we are only speaking like that, we can go into another organization and being engaged there. We are there as Christian churches and as a council of churches and CCIA. And, and then we must always try to find a message that is rooted in our Christian values. That doesn't mean that we should use a Canaan language that is not understood by others, but we should try to explain why our message is rooted in our Christian values, not to overestimate it, but not to exclude it. Because if we exclude it, it will not be listened to. Very good, thank you, Chelmania. Well, I think we're rapidly coming to the end of our allocated time for this uh, gathering. So, uh, and in the absence of other questions that have been fed to me, I uh, want to take this opportunity for some, some closing remarks. And then we're going to move to a, uh, a video retrospective, a five minute video that shows images of uh, past CCIA members and leaders. And I'm sure some of you will, will find your pictures uh, on that video, so please stay tuned for that. Uh, but I simply want to again reiterate my thanks and my appreciation uh, for all of those who've contributed to this discussion, to the present and past moderators of CCIA for their insights, their wisdom, their experience that they've shared with us uh, through this interactive dialogue, and uh, maybe especially to the interviewers to those who have formulated such insightful questions, incisive questions that help to elicit this, uh, this wisdom and this experience from, from the panelists. So thank you very much for the effort that you've put into that. And I express those thanks, especially on behalf of the current generation of CCIA members who are meeting during these days, partly physically here in Johannesburg and partly online through a virtual conferencing platform. Uh, because I think that you, through this discussion, have given us a much deeper sense of the heritage, but also of the continuing responsibility and need for CCIA, for the work of the churches internationally in addressing the issues that before, are before us collectively as a human community. So I think you've given great inspiration and great energy uh, for that ongoing task as we continue our discussions as we include, conclude actually the term of this generation of CCIA and look forward to the renewal of CCIA for a next period beyond the 11th assembly in Karlsruhe next year. So thank you to everybody who's contributed to this discussion. Thank you to all those who have participated uh, and uh, followed the discussion. 
And uh, I want to also take the opportunity to thank all my colleagues who have worked so hard behind the scenes to organize this event, to give us this moment for celebration and reflection on the history over these 75 years of CCIA. And in particular, uh, without disrespecting the contribution of any other colleagues, I want to give a special shout out to my colleague, Sigma Asfor, who has uh, really taken the lead in initiating and organizing this event. So thank you so much, Sigma, for this, uh, for this gift. And then finally, before we move to the video, I want everybody now to turn on their webcams so we can see everybody in a grid form on this, uh, on this page and we can wave to each other. And then we will segue into the, uh, the closing video and the conclusion of this session. Thanks, everybody.